Hello, welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. Today we're going to talk about the ERA and the Mormon Church. And I have a slideshow presentation. It's kind of long and we're going to try to go through it fast. But if we feel the need to comment, which we will because it's awful and mm -hmm. so bad. And we have a lot of opinions. <laughs> okay, so the Mormon Church and the Equal Rights Amendment. So the so first we're just going to give a brief history of the ERA. Um, so we're going to talk first about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth was born in New York in 1815. She joined the anti-slavery movement and even attended a world's anti-slavery convention while on her honeymoon, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> um, her husband, Henry, was an abolitionist lecturer. So they were oh, he was like super cool with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> while there, Elizabeth was angry about the exclusion of women in those proceedings. Eight years later, in 1848, she and Lucretia Mott held the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Declaration of Sentiments, 1848. The Declaration of Sentiments was written primarily by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, so that was the lady in the last slide, mm -hmm. right? And was based on the Declaration of Independence to parallel the struggles of the Founding Fathers with those of the women's movement. The document enumerated the limited legal rights of women, their restricted opportunities for education, and the curbs on women's public involvement. So the next one is Susan B. Anthony. Susan was born into a Quaker family in 1820 in Massachusetts. Although she was born in Massachusetts, her hometown was Rochester, New York. So right around when Joseph has his first vision. Oh. Just kidding. She was inspired by the Quaker belief that everyone was created equally under God. She collected anti-slavery petitions at the age of 17 and gave many speeches against slavery. And she met Elizabeth Cady Stan in 1851. Ooh, besties for life. Yeah. Okay, so the arrest of Susan B. Anthony was in 1872 after Congress passed the 14th and 15th Amendments, which gave voting rights to African-American men, but not to women. Susan and Elizabeth became very angry. Together, they formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, and they pushed for an amendment that would give women the right to vote. In 1872, Susan was arrested for voting. She was tried and fined $100 for her crime, which was much more in that time period, by the way. Right. This angered a lot of people, and it brought national attention to the suffrage movement. So maybe it was a good thing. But, I mean, sure. women should not be arrested for that. But Yeah. Okay, Mormons in the National Women's Suffrage Association. As president of the group, Elizabeth Stanton refused to exclude Mormon women, Black women, and Indian women. And I just think that's interesting that they're ranking women. So there's a guy, I think it's Paul Reeve. Um, he wrote a book called um, Religion of a Different Color. Sorry, it's sitting on my shelf. But he wrote this book and he in the book he he talks about how more people saw Mormons as a different race entirely. And so it's interesting that they're they're putting Mormons in with with black women and Indian women. So it's like anyway, that's kind of what the context is for that. But it's really interesting. Yeah, but it's really good of her not to exclude any of these people. So good on Elizabeth Cady Stan. The 14th Amendment falls short. So the 14th Amendment states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. In 1894, U.S. Supreme Court agreed to consider in re Lockwood a case that allowed states to limit the legal definition of person to men. So Belva A. Lockwood sought to practice law in Virginia and was rejected because she was a woman. This was reversed in 1971 in Reed versus Reed. Yeah, so this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we need the Equal Rights Amendment passed, because cases like this will come up and say, oh, women aren't actually people. I don't think anybody believes that anymore. Like, I don't. I don't think you could meet any person on the street and say, do you think that women are people? Well, they're not going to say, say no. that, but I mean, like, in, but, in law, like. I don't know. People people just try to get around the law as much as they can. But I but I agree with that. No one's going to say they're not people. But I'm just talking about it needs to be written in our constitution. Women's rights are not in our constitution right now. That's what this is about. So, okay. So protections for women in the early 1900s. Through the late 1800s and early 1900s, laws were put in place that protected women. Some laws limited the number of hours a woman was allowed to work and the time of day that she could work those hours. Other laws put certain work environments off limits for women. For example, it was illegal for women to work in places where liquor was sold or in mines. And I think one of the reasons why women had to stop working at a certain time of day is so that they can take care of their husband and their kids. So um, that they could continue working at home, but not Right. <laughs> right. There was a special concern about potential injury to a woman's reproductive capacity. Women's health had to be safeguarded or the human race itself could would be damaged. Many of these protections valued women by their ability to have children. Many protectionists were opposed to the ERA because they felt that these laws would go away. So, wow. Right. So it's like, 
Like we need the ERA because we need women to have babies. Like it's. Well, no, we don't need the ERA because. Oh we yeah, need we, women that's what I mean. Have, we um, don't need the ERA. That's like uh, well intentioned, but like, um, where where are your priorities? Um, and the priorities are women making babies rather right. than women being able to take care of themselves. Right. And I have a list here. It says women were seen as frail, vulnerable, weaker, ill-suited to the workplace, the, to the world workplace, and more vulnerable to occupational diseases and work hazards, emotionally, intellectually different. So this is, this was their opinion back then in the 18, 1900s. So, um, yeah. Okay. So Alice Paul was born a Quaker in 1885. Alice Paul helped secure the passage of the 19th amendment, which granted women the right to vote. It was ratified on August 18th, 1920, and went on to write the equal rights amendment in 1923. Alice's mother, Tracy, was a suffragist and would take her to the suffrage meetings. Alice got a bachelor's degree in biology, a master's degree in sociology, and even went on to, and even went on to earn a PhD. That's really cool. So the Equal Rights Amendment, this is when she first drafted it in, eight, in 1923, and this is all it says. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So men and women have equal rights. That's all it's trying to say. Okay, so then in 1943, it was changed a little bit. It's, I think it's been amended three times throughout its history, and so this is the next... Um, the next, this is the changing of the amendment. So do you want to go ahead and read this? Okay. Section one, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Section two, the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. Section three, this amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. Okay. So yeah, they're just, they're just minor changes, basically the same thing. N no rights will be denied on account of sex. Okay, so then the Relief Society endorses ERA in 1943. So this is a really cool thing, or I think it's really cool. Um, so in 1943, General Relief Society President Amy Brown Lyman and the Young Women's General President Lucy Grant Cannon formally endorsed the Equal Rights Amendment. So they write in this little post, what is this, a postcard or some kind of letter? Um, Senator Judge A. Murdoch, we join with the women of the United States in their appeal for equal rights with men and urge your favorable consideration and vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. So these Mormon women are saying, please vote for the amendment. Like, I just think that's really cool because of how the church changes their stance. Yeah. But. So interestingly, um, the Relief Society was considering opposing it, but um, J. Reuben Clark in 1950, um, he was the first presidency counselor, um, said, uh, so on the, third, on the day that this third version of the ERA was moving through the Senate, President Clark suggested that the Relief Society presidency stay out of it because there will be some of the women who think it is a fine thing. So he was afraid that they would, um, like... Oppose it? Well, yeah. he was afraid the, the Relief Society would oppose it, and then by doing that, all uh, the, women. the women who were in favor of it would not come back to church. What is that called? Offend? Yeah. So uh -huh. he was afraid that they would offend the women who were in favor of the ERA by opposed by publicly opposing it. So he wanted to make sure that they stayed out of it. Of course, they don't care about that nowadays when it's reversed. Um, yeah. Anyway, does that make sense? It re reversed in one way. Like, uh, like when <laughs> they don't mind saying don't lobby for rights right now, even though there's women that will, that want to lobby for rights. Anyway. So yeah. Cause ahead. they have told, yeah. So, they have told us not to lobby for rights. Right. Like just leave it alone. Right. Anyway. Okay, so women's rights in the early Mormon church. Okay, so in the early church, women were allowed to use their priesthood outside of the temple because in, in um, this is D. Michael Quinn's theory is that he thinks that every woman who goes through the temple just has the priesthood. She's given the priesthood there in the washing, the initiatory and the endowment. And so during the early years of the church, women were allowed to use this priesthood outside of the temple, whereas now women only use it in the temple during the washing and anointings. Um, they would give blessings of healing, blessings promising salvation, and one, one woman reportedly raised a man from the dead. And that's a really interesting and creepy and fun story. Right. So then Relief Society, okay, so there's a change. I just wanted to say this briefly. So in the revelation given by Joseph, it was later changed so that it, the wording was different. So on March 17th of 1842, Joseph said to the Relief Society, because they were starting the Relief Society, 
He says, I turn the key to you. And then later it was changed by George A. Smith. He says, I turn the key in your behalf. That's what he made it. He changed the language to say that because they're trying to move away from women having priesthood power. And then in October 1st of 1969, Joseph Fielding Smith kind of made it. And this was, he's just making it, he's just emphasizing it more, but he's trying to say that women, you have priesthood in, con in connection with your husband. So it's your husband who has the priesthood, but you don't. Um, and we'll see more of that later as we move on with the slides. Okay, so Brigham Young in 1856, he said, there is a curse upon the woman that is not upon the man, namely that her whole affections shall be towards her husband. He shall rule over her. I don't like that. So he's, um, I guess this extends the, the Adam and Eve. The Eve's curse is, the woman is cursed. <laughs> like, anyway, I just thought that was a but like, way to put how, it. Yeah, how interesting that the curse upon the woman he's talking about is that her whole affection shall be towards her husband. Yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But I wonder what the curse of man is, that he doesn't have any affection towards his, like, 50 wives. Well, you know, his wife, Zina, said that um, love we regard as a, a, a dangerous mm -hmm. part of polygamy. So I just added this in here because it's interesting to me. There are four key attributes to true womanhood. She's supposed to be pious, pure, domestic, and submissive. And all of those feel really gross to me. <laughs> Like the inner, my inner feminist is cringing. Oh, uh, not just cringing, screaming. Um, screaming. Yeah, 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 it's pretty bad. Okay. Do you want to read this one? So Heber C. Kimball in 1856 said, I want to know what good a wife is to me unless she will let me lead and guide and let me govern her by the word of God. When a wife is obedient to her husband, there is union, there is heaven. What's a good, what, what good is a wife to me if she won't let me lead a guide? Yeah, it's really, really gross. Okay, so Orson Hyde in 1850, about 1857, he said, he described the order of heaven as placing man in the front rank. Hence, he is first to be addressed. Woman follows under the protection of his counsels and the superior strength of his arm. Her desire should be unto her husband and he shall rule over her. And this was really interesting. No man can be exalted to a celestial glory in the kingdom of God whose wife rules over him. The woman who rules over her husband thereby deprives herself of a celestial glory. So he's making this like a doctrine. Like this is a celestial thing. Like if, if a woman rules over her husband, boom, that's you. She cannot, she deprives herself of celestial glory. Like no wives can be wearing the pants. Yeah. In yeah. The home or you will just not go to heaven. Yeah. It's super gross. So like, and there, and that reminds me of the, so part of the equal rights for women is a woman having rights over her body, which can also sometimes mean abortion. And um, they would, there's a concerning abortion. The church leaders said that if a woman does have an abortion, she's not guaranteed salvation. So it's like all these regulations, the woman has to be a woman's rights will keep her out of heaven. A woman having rights will keep her out of heaven. And that's just really gross. To me. Well, and this also is starting to add up to why, um, why, you can't have LGBTQ members going to the temple because um, who is going to rule over who yeah. in um, a lesbian relationship? Who is going to rule over who in a gay relationship? Mm -hmm. Like somebody has to be in their mind. Yeah. And somebody has to be domesticated and submissive and pious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really gross. Who is it going to be? It's not, it's not going to be me. So it better be you. <laughs> okay. So plural marriage. Ironically, plural marriage strengthened many Mormon women who had who had to learn to be independent and resourceful and sometimes supported their families for years while their husbands attended to other families or served a series of, of proselyting missions. Plural wives were often expected to earn their own keep, raising money for themselves and their children. They often took full responsibility in rearing their children, usually alone. Polygamous wives were some of the strongest proponents for women's rights, which you can totally understand because they're they're having to suffer more because they don't have rights. Yeah. Because they can't, they can't have income, they can't own their land, and yet they're doing all of this alone with right. like little to no help from their husband. Right. And there's a quote here by Anne Fryer Scott. She says, "As long as the church practiced polygamy, the loyalty and support of the leading women was essential for survival." So I just thought that was really interesting because they need the women to stay. They need the women on their side. Okay. So do you want to read this one? Okay, so Zina Presendia Young Williams card. <laughs> A lot of names. Yeah. Zina Presendia Young Williams card 
Zina was the daughter of Brigham Young and Zina Huntington. She was the first dean of women at BYU. She fought on a national level for women's suffrage and the right to practice plural marriage. That's cool. Yeah, and Emmeline B. Wells. Emmeline was the fifth General Relief Society president for the church from 1910 to 1921. She was the editor of the Women's Exponent for 37 years. She represented the state of Utah at both the National and American Women's Suffrage Conventions and was, pres and was president of the Utah Women's Suffrage Association. So these are really amazing women in our church history. I'm going to read this one. Women's Exponent uh, was founded in 1872. So this is what we were talking about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Women's Exponent began in 1872 and was eventually replaced by the Relief Society magazine in 1914. It was published entirely by women for 27 years. The masthead slogan for 20 of those years read, The Rights of Women of Zion and the Rights of Women of All Nations. As early as the second edition, Emmeline B. Wells made women's rights a central concern through editorials for the paper and by reprinting articles from other suffrage papers. Yeah, so just, I thought that was really neat. This Their, their magazine, the, the slogan says, the rights of women of Zion and the rights of women of all nations. So that was one of the main focuses of this newspaper. Like, they would not get away with that now. So um, so some of these newspaper articles, um, so Emily B. Wells wrote in some of the, in these articles, but she wrote under a pen name. So the pen name was Beecher. And so that's why you'll see like, not her name as the author. But she said, people fear the effect upon the family if women should vote and think. That they think that the tenderness and sweetness of the family relation has something to do with weakness. Mothers make mothers more and you will make their children more. You will not make them coarse by giving them power. Is God coarse because he is infinite? That which a family needs more than anything else is a higher state of womanly development. And I just love, yes, <laughs> that deserves an applause for sure. Well said. Mm -hmm. You want to read this one? So also in the, in the Women's Exponent by M.E. Kimball, they said, and now the question arises, is it right to let women vote? I conclude it came from the unthinking part of society, those who have never weighed the subject. The scripture says, the man is not without the woman or the woman without the man and the Lord. And if created in the image of God, how could she be companionable without intelligence? Accordingly, she must possess this quality. Or did our father bequeath this gift to his sons only? If so, what kind of posterity will they raise? I object to this idea, realizing that we are beloved by our father equally to themselves, unless they keep his commandments better. I like that. I conclude it came from the, the unthinking part of society. <laughs> I like love that. Okay, so. That's, how, that's what they used to call um, the idiots. The unthinking part of society. Okay, so the end of plural marriage. So I just wanted to map out the timeline really quick of plural marriage and, and how that pertains to the ERA. So in 1890, on October 6th, there was the first manifesto. Was, and it was presented to the membership in General Conference by Wilfred Woodruff um, after the Edmunds Tucker Act in 1887. This is what people mostly, when they talk about the manifesto, that's what they mean is the first one. They don't typically refer to the end, any of the other ones. Wasn't this one more of a like um, suggestion that they stopped doing polygamy? Yeah, like, oh yeah, we probably shouldn't be doing this. So in 1904, Joseph F. Smith presented the second manifesto, which completely banned new plural marriages worldwide and threatened excommunication to those who participated in it. Notice that's 1904. Um, we know that they were continuing to do plural marriage into the 1920s or beyond. Yeah. So 1905, this is just really interesting. Uh, Matthias F. Cowley and John W. Taylor of the Quorum of the Twelve, so these are two apostles, they resigned because the church's stance on polygamy. So they believed that polygamy was right. They're like, hey, we're going to leave now. 1911, on March 28th, although John Taylor, John W. Taylor still believed that the church was true, he was excommunicated for his opposition to ending polygamy and died five years later. Um, Cowley's priesthood was suspended on May 11th, 1911 and was restored and the priesthood was restored in 1936. What? His priesthood. So the other guy. So the other guy, Cowley, um, his priesthood was revoked and then it was restored later. Anyway, so they're just showing the other guy couldn't be reinstated because he passed away. So 1933, there was a third manifesto that was issued. So not many people know about that, but it just, it wasn't happening in the church. People were still felt that this was a true doctrine. So in 1943, the church learned that one of their apostles, um, Elder Richard R. Lyman, had entered into a secret plural marriage and was excommunicated on November 12th of 1943. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so then this is another interesting part. If you think about this timeline and when polygamy stops being a thing, it also has to do with women's um, priesthood. So polygamy and priesthood, like, they go hand in hand with the women. 
And so the priesthood was revoked in the 1920s. So throughout the 1920s, church leaders increasingly drew bolder lines between spiritual gifts and priesthood powers. With the clarification of the priesthood role came restriction of the women's sphere. Church leaders made it clear that women did not have the right to priesthood power. Further definition of priesthood, including healing, anointing with oil, etc., as exclusive functions of the elders. So they're like, oh, we're going to do away with polygamy. We might as well do away with all of your rights. So, yeah. yeah polygamy was a right. No. <laughs> <laughs> polygamy is not. You're right. It's not a right. But like, anyway, I just think that's interesting. Do you want to read this one? A letter to the Relief Society General Presidency in 1946, Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, While the authorities of the church have ruled that it is permissible under certain conditions and with the approval of the priesthood for sisters to wash and anoint other sisters, yet they feel that yet they feel that it is far better for us to follow the plan the Lord has given us and send for the elders of the church to come and administer to the sick and afflicted. Yes, yeah, so like it's not it's not a woman's job, it's the man's job. And and there's stories of of I can't remember which prophet it was. I want to say it was John Taylor, but I can't remember. Leonora Taylor. I think they both together as husband and wife gave blessings to people. So, so one would seal the anointing and one would bless or whatever. Um, but they gave women gave blessings. And I, there was some times where, where um, uh, Brigham Young would send for his carriage. He'd have his wives go in and then he'd send them to somebody who was sick and then they would go and give them blessings. So like why I'm just frustrated that women, it would be so good for the church if the women could use their priesthood. I'm just surprised by this because I, I knew that um, women had the were given the priesthood and were able to like bless and heal in Joseph Smith's time. But you're saying that they could do it up until the 1940s, 20s. 1920s. Oh yeah, I guess you're right. You're, you're right. In the 1940s, they were they were uh, still trying to tamp it, tamp down. it down. You're right. You're right. So for sure, up until the 1920s. But yeah, in in the 1940s, he's like, hey, we need to be clear on this. You guys can do this in the temple, but not outside the temple. So yeah. Yeah, why else do you think about that? Like, man, the church so was like the wild, wild west in the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, oh yeah. Like, well, the eighteen fifties too in Utah was so wild, wild, wild west. Yeah. Okay, so and so this is just an overview. So, with the practice of polygamy comes the companion of a woman using the priesthood, which is what I was talking about earlier. So, although polygamous women had greater responsibilities in and out of the home, they had the freedom to bless their family and others with their priesthood power, which is really good because women were often alone and their children they were raising their children alone. And like, if your kid's gonna get sick, just give them a blessing. In 1890, polygamy was banned, and shortly after that, their right to priesthood power was revoked, like we talked about. Women seemed to shrink rather than grow with these changes. So, like, yeah, anyway. Hmm. Okay, do you want to do this one? All right, so women speaking in general conference. Although the church readily brags that Lucy Mack Smith spoke in general conference as early as 1845, this was unusual. Lucy had requested to speak, and it was just before the exodus of the saints from Nauvoo to Salt Lake. In 1929, October General Conference, the three female auxiliary presidents spoke very briefly. Their talks took up two pages out of the 140 pages of the conference report. In 1930, in the April and October General Conferences, the three auxiliary presidents also spoke. In April, their talks took up three out of 204 pages. October, October their talks took up three out of 148 pages. Outside of these four examples, women did not speak in general conference, and their various meetings were not considered part of general conference during this time. So, yeah, so nothing that the women did, none of their meetings um, were really part of the general conference. So people will say, people have bragged to me on TikTok, they'll say, oh, well, Lucy Mack Smith spoke in 1845, but there was these, these outside of these four examples, I couldn't find anything else of these women, of women speaking in general conference. So it's not... Women, yeah, it's not a thing. So since 1830, when the church started, they've been having general conferences. And those four talks are the only talks until, when did when did they? So we'll, like we'll the talk 80s? about that. Yeah, so we'll talk about that. So yeah, outside of these four examples, women did not speak in general conference. Okay, so the church in the 1970s and the equal rights movement. So the birth of an ensign. So beginning in June of 1970, the presidency of the church placed the funds of the Relief Society in their words, where it belongs on the priesthood. Conveniently, mm -hmm. about a month before the Women's Strike for Equality March. Naturally. Naturally, yeah. Um, so the Ensign Magazine replaced all other church periodicals, including the Relief Society Magazine, silencing women's self-published voices. So, yes. <laughs> it is In its very first issue, published in January of 1971, President Joseph Fielding Smith warned that the forces of evil were attacking the family. Without calling out supporters of the ERA specifically, he cautioned, 
Do you spend as much time making your family and home successful as you do in pursuing social and professional success? Are you devoting your best creative energy to the most important unit in society, the family? Or is your relationship with your family merely a routine, unrewarding part of life? Parent and child must be willing to put family responsibilities first in order to achieve family exaltation. Oh my gosh. It seemed like he's also seemed to be warning. He's like, if you, if you're trying to have lobby for women's rights, you won't, your family won't, you could be the cause of your family not being exalted. That's kind of what I'm reading here as well. Um, okay. Do you want to read this one? In the same issue of the Ensign, then Apostle Thomas S. Monson, not Thomas Monson, <laughs> released an article titled The Women's Movement, Liberation or Deception. Monson emphasized that every woman has been endowed by God with distinctive characteristics, gifts, and talents in order that she may fulfill a specific mission in the eternal plan. He went on to say that what the modernists, even the liberationists, fail to remember is that women in addition to being persons. Oh, that's nice. He recognized that they're <laughs> people. Not everybody does that. Sorry. In addition to being persons also belong to a sex and that with the different and that with the differences in sex are associated important differences in function and behavior. He ended by challenging the women to sustain their husbands, strengthen their homes and serve their God, reminding women that the husband is the head and that they were the helpmates. You know, I prefer um, her perspective in um, the my big my big fat Greek wedding. The head and the neck. Yeah. The women or the husband is the head. The woman is the neck. She can turn the head where whichever any direction she wants. Yeah. So General Conference of 1971. In the April General Conference, Elder H. Burke Peterson of the presiding bishopric stated. One of the greatest tragedies of our day is the confusion in the minds of some which would cause mothers to go to work in the marketplace. <laughs> he said it is better for a mother to be home ironing clothes and making cookies than to be away learning, typing, or shorthand to improve her job qualifications. Mm. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. So 1972, the ERA is passed in both the House and the Senate, so it's working its way through. General Conference um, in October 1973. Do you want to read this one? N. Eldon Tanner of the First Presidency stated, We hear so much about emancipation, independence, sexual liberation, birth control, abortion, and other insidious propaganda, belittling the role of motherhood, all of which is Satan's way of destroying women, the home, and the family, the basic unit of society. So the so if you're talking about women's rights, women's rights are Satan's way of destroying everything, the women and the family. Destroying this, women. This makes so much sense to me now. How, like, okay, this is a tangent, but bear with me. My mom was born in 1959, and she is a wild person at heart. But she has been trained that she must not do any of the wild person things. She has been trained that she needs to act like a mother and be subdued and um, domestic, even though that's not her at all. Wild things as in going to work? Or what do you mean by wild things? Like going outside and getting your feet dirty. Like um, doing things that aren't the focus of just your child. And I wonder if it's because she was raised before she was told that she must, um, like, restrict herself. You know what I mean? Like she was 10 years old. She, was a, she graduated high school in 1977. So oh, okay. about this time... She was being told to to make herself smaller. Yeah. But she had already become who she was going to be. Yeah, I think the children's most formative years are when they're really young, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what you're, what, what's going on with your mom. Yeah. But, I don't know. That was, a, that was a tension. Okay, so in, so Utah residents were in, okay, so 65% of Utah residents were in favor of the ERA. This is from the Deseret News Survey, November 15th of 1974. So, the majority of people, Utah residents, were in favor of this passing. 63.1% 63, 63 of LDS respondents supported the ERA. This is according to the same Deseret News survey on November 15th. So, so more people, more LDS people want this passed than who don't want it passed. I just wanted to point that out because the church is emphatically against the ERA. And that's, and that's that was 1974. So what, what, ha what would happen? And <laughs> what would happen if we did the survey in 2023? And what I think is funny is I think if you were to ask women if they have equal rights, they'd probably say yes, but they don't. Like we don't, we, our rights are not in the constitution, mm -hmm. but I don't think people know that. People don't well, really what, think about what that. What it is, is they think that this already passed, like this is already done and been done a long time ago. 
-hmm. we assume that it's already taken care of. Yeah, the, the ERA hit its peak in in the 70s and it has um, never had never had that much traction ever since then. So Okay, so the church speaks out against the ERA in 1974. So Barbara B. Smith, the 10th Relief Society General President, was chosen to make the church's first official statement against the ERA. During a message given on December 13th of 1974, two weeks after this Utah survey, she stated that the ERA is so broad that it is inadequate, inflexible, and vague, and so all-encompassing that it is non-definitive. So it's, it's just bad because it's just too broad. It's too vague. Too vague. The ERA is a confused, this is her, by Ruby Smith, the ERA is a confused step backward in time instead of a clear stride forward into the future. Um, how? <laughs> right. How? <laughs> Do you want to read this one? So in Church News, January 1975, they published an article decrying Equal Rights Amendment as not only imperfect, but dangerous. It went on to denounce the ERA as unnecessary, uncertain, and undesirable, con condemning it as condemning it as a unisex law that fails to acknowledge the fact that men and women are different, made so by a divine creator. Each has his or her role. One is incomplete without the other. But the, but but separate state and... I won't, what and is religion it? Church and Separating state. church and state. The existence of a divine creator saying that men and women are different should not be upheld in law. That is That is not separation of church and state. Right. I agree. And I was just thinking about that too, whenever you were reading it. Yeah. But also to call it dangerous, it's dangerous. I guess we're getting to get into that more because there are people who do think the ERA is dangerous. It is dangerous. And I can tell you why, because then women would be out from under the control of the men. I see what you mean. It's dangerous to the men, to the men, to the patriarchies. It is dangerous in that way. But there are people who do think that it's legitimately dangerous in other ways that we'll talk about. So church policies in 1975, prayers and sacrament meeting, priesthood meeting. The first presidency recommends that only those who bear the Melchizedek priesthood or Aaronic priesthood be invited to offer the opening and closing prayers in sacrament meetings, including fast meetings. So women in 1975 were not allowed to pray in sacrament meeting. Ooh. Have you prayed in sacrament meeting? I have, yes. I've yeah, even spoken. I, like I've spoken in state conference and things like that. But like in 1975, see. women couldn't say prayers. That's estupido. <laughs> it is. Like, it's estupido. what does that have to do with anything? Like, oh, praying, pr praying, <laughs> yeah, praying is like not you have to have priesthood to pray. Levina Fielding Anderson, 1976, as the associate editor of the Enzyme magazine, Levina stated in one article, The church provides strong support for a woman who wants to be a mother. At the same time, some women feel undue pressure to have as many children as they can. I wonder where that came from. Hmm. At the same time, holding up high standards of performance as a mother. Even though a woman's most important contribution is in the home to her family, it need not be her only contribution. I imagine that the Lord would not give his approval with any great frequency, but there will be situations and times when he does and will approve of a woman working outside the home. So I thought that was good. Like she, it's, she, she can only say so little. She's one of the September 6th. So, um, I don't know. She can only say so much in order. I think if anyone speaks out more than that, they get in trouble. But anyway, so she's like, like, hey, can we? She's like, oh, he won't approve it very much, but there's going to be situations. It'll be okay. Like, right. trying to just slip it in there that it's not a hard and fast rule for right. people who have special situations. Right. Just like, okay, so. Everyone. Right. Okay, so in the same edition of the Enzyme, in that uh, same edition of the Enzyme, Barbara B. Smith in 1976 stated that the Equal Rights Amendment is not the way. And so, so it's just funny that these two, there's like two conflicting ideas in the same Enzyme. Like, oh, you might, like, God might approve of you guys, of you working and, and making money. And then like the, the area is not the way to do this. Like, although if women are working and not getting paid equally, like that's anyway. Okay. So 35 States in 1977, 35 out of 38 States needed ratified the equal rights amendment. So we're so close at this point, 1977, so close to hitting the mark. So the first presidency statement in 1977, as the Equal Rights Amendment issue is, acti is activated in some states, we suggest that you urge members of the church at, as citizens of this great na nation to join others in efforts to defeat the ERA. So this is the fir their first presidency calling on members to defeat the ERA. In the 1970s, the church joined the efforts of Phyllis Schlafly and others to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. Phyllis Schlafly. <laughs> yeah, they, we watched, um, I think it was last year, we watched the show Mrs. America. And it's, it's a really good one. It stars Kate Blanchett. Mm -hmm. Kate Blanchett's Phyllis Schlafly. She does a fantastic job. There are so many 
amazing women in that show. But anyway, in the show, you'll see a lot of drops uh, or what do they call it? Like Easter references, eggs or yeah. references to the Mormon church. And there's one point where uh, Kate Blanchett's on the phone with, with uh, Ballard and talking about putting down the ERA. But anyway, mm -hmm. so great show. You should go watch it. You'll learn a lot of things. And you'll be so mad. <laughs> I mean, if you're like me. <laughs> if you're a feminist. Okay, do you want to go? Okay, Boyd K. Packer in 1977. Should the Equal Rights Amendment pass, it threatens to be chief among the problems which were intended to be solutions. Not not sure how, but... They're not doing a good job of explaining how. Right, well, uh, I guess this one, Boyd K. Packer talks about it. I don't agree with him, but he'll talk about it. So Boyd K. Packer in 1977, this is him talking. He's talking about why it's bad. We cannot eliminate through any... Oh, no, this isn't, this isn't quite when he's talking about what it's bad. He's just laying down the groundwork. We cannot eliminate through any pattern of legislation or regulation the differences between men and women. There are basic things that a man needs that a woman does not need. There are things that a man feels that a woman never does feel. What are these things? I don't know. <laughs> there are basic things that a woman needs that a man never needs. Is it pads? <laughs> it's a tampon. <laughs> and there are things that a woman feels that a man never feels, nor should he. Uh, cramps? <laughs> these differences make women in basic needs literally opposite from men. I don't know about opposite, more like yeah. adjacent. <laughs> a man, for instance, needs to feel protective and yes, dominant, if you will, uh -huh. in leading his family. A woman needs to feel protected in the bearing of children and the nurturing of them. So he's he's clearly, have we, he's have, so uh, very clearly defining. Have, the, have you never heard of like what happens, what's called mama bear, where she's protective and she will, oh, yeah. she will stand up and fight for her babies? Mm-hmm. That in that situation, she is not the one being protected. She is the one protecting, and that is a very common, very natural thing. Yeah. Okay. You want to read this one? Okay. He continues. We care about the family. We study the family. We pray over the family. We work for the stability of the family. We work to preserve and protect the institution of the family. But only their version of the family. Yes. A very specific a mother, father, and at least two children family. Minimum. We analyze the effect of every influence that comes along as it may ultimately change by way of strengthening or threaten by way of weakening the family. We have the lingering ominous suspicion that the proponents of the Equal Rights Amendment have paid little, if any, attention to the family at all. Like, this is going to kill the family. This is going to hurt the family. And you guys have not been paying attention. Like the, the members of the family that have been paying attention are the female portion. And the ones that don't care at all about the ERA... Are the ones that are male because it does not affect them, right? Yeah, and the and the polygamous wives were the one, the biggest proponents for one of the biggest proponents for the ERA. So it's like, oh, are these women not? Are these polygamous wives not paying attention to the family because they're proponents? Like anyway, yeah. Boyd K. Packer. So he's continuing. I am for protecting the rights of a woman to be a woman, a feminine female woman, a wife and a mother. <laughs> I am for protecting the rights of a man to be a man, a masculine male man, a husband and a father. <laughs> I prefer my mailman to be masculine. <laughs> anyway, just oh, I just I I want to roll my eyes so hard that they like see my brain before they come back up and look at this screen again. <laughs> okay, so Boy K. Packer gives you reasons not to be pro ERA. Do you want to do you want to list this off? So he says women would be women would be drafted in the war. He thinks that there will be ch increased child abuse. And that child rights somehow would come about, that teens would have more intercourse with other teens, children would move away from their homes, children would choose to work rather than be educated, and children would be eligible to vote. I'm not sure where he's, I'm not sure the logic behind some of these, but. Okay, so there's a first presidency statement in 1978. It's Equal Rights Amendment deceptively, okay. Its Equal Rights Amendment's deceptively simple language deals with practically every aspect of American life without considering the possible train of unnatural consequences, which could result because of its very vagueness. Encouragement of those who seek a unisex society, an increase in the practice of homosexual and lesbian activities, and other concepts, which could alter the natural, God-given relationships of men and women. So, if we pass the ERA, there's going to be more homosexuals, there's going to be more gays and lesbians. And This sounds like a great idea. Well, okay, so you know what? I think it was even Boyd K. Packer who said that the three great threats are gays, feminists, and intellectuals. The ERA would just help all of all them. of those. Um, so let's get it passed right now. We need more lesbians. So. <laughs> uh, do you want to read this one? Uh, the Mormons for the ERA march in July 1978. 
Sonia Johnson, and about 20 others marched in Washington, D.C. under the banner Mormons for ERA. Mormons for ERA. She became an articulate spokeswoman for equality. In General Conference of 1978, although not addressing the ERA specifically, Sister Elaine Cannon, the Young Women's General President, stated, Personal opinions may vary. Eternal principles never do. When the prophet speaks, sisters, and then she pounces the podium, the debate is over. So, like, don't, don't do, don't, oh, yeah, only listen to the prophet. So this is more about Sonia Johnson. Do you want to read it? Sonia achieved national exposure in 1978, and in September of 1979, she gave a speech at a meeting with the American Psychological Association in New York. Sonia Johnson denounced the church's nationwide lobbying efforts to prevent the passage of ERA as immoral and illegal. Mormon anti-ERA activity, though organized and directed by the hierarchy of the church from Salt Lake down through regional and local male leaders, is covert activity, not openly done in the name of the church. Members are cautioned not to reveal that they are Mormons or organized by the church when they lobby, write letters, donate money, and pass out anti-ERA brochures door-to-door -door through whole states. Instead, they are directed to say that they are concerned citizens following the dictates of their individual consciences. Since they are, in fact, following the dictates of the prophet's conscience and would revise their own overnight if he were to revise his, nothing could be further from the truth. So yeah, I thought that was kind of crazy that... Uh... Not crazy, but like, I don't, I just don't like it. Like, don't tell them that you're Mormon. Just tell them that you're not for equal rights, that you're a concerned citizen. And Didn't they do this with um, Prop 8? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure they did this with pretty much any any um, political push that the church has done. Like, don't do it in the name of the church. Don't do it as members, of, like, officially as the church. Just do it. Yeah. And they asked people in the church buildings, well, well with, with that Prop 8, they're like, hey, go lobby for us and use that time like use church time to do it. Anyway, Howard W. Hunter in 1979, he says, I suppose you would say it is a man's viewpoint to throw a burden upon a woman to maintain the stability and the sweetness of marriage. But this seems to be her divine nature. So he's admitting it's true. <laughs> <laughs> she has a superior spirituality in the marriage relationship. So she's superior. And the opportunity to encourage, uplift, teach, and be the one who sets the example of the family for righteous living. When, a woman can when women come to the point of realizing it is more important to be superior, than to be equal. <laughs> they will find the real job in living those, wait, they will find the real job in living those principles than the Lord set out in his divine plan. So, so, so you being less means that you're, no, being submissive actually makes you um, uh, superior spiritually. Yes. So go ahead and continue being submissive and so, superior so, spiritually. So being less you makes you more, don't ask for equal rights. Yeah. No. Oh. Sonia Johnson was excommunicated on December 5th of 1979. So sh that, that's how it worked out for her. And, Ooh. and she is like so amazing. So go listen to her um, interviews and things like that. She's just an amazing person. And I'm, this is really unfortunate that the church is treating anyone who lobbies for rights. It seems that they're going to just excommunicate them. It's just, it's just easier that way, I guess. Okay. So, um, in, in 1980, the church made this little booklet, which I have a copy of it, and, and maybe one of these days I'll read it and record it. But the, they made a, um, a booklet called the Church, and the, Pro the Church and the Proposed Equal Rights Amendment, a moral issue. So they're calling this a moral issue. The ERA is a serious moral issue, and its passage could significantly affect the standard of right and wrong that are vital, that are vital to us as a religious people. So, yeah. All right, and then in General Conference, October 1980, Ezra Taft Benson, then president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, reiterated that a mother's place is in the home. Beguiling voices in the world cry out for alternative lifestyles for women. They maintain that some women are better suited for careers than for marriage and motherhood. These individuals spread their discontent by the propaganda that here are more exciting and self-fulfilling roles for women than homemaking. It's because homemaking is seriously boring most of the time. Also, you freaking live here and you can help take care of the freaking house. There are some women who, who do are, are so good at being mothers and homemakers that that's just like, they just fit into it really well. There are some women that it's really, really hard and it's the, both are valid. If you want to be a mother, great. If you don't want to be a mother, that's also great. Like mm -hmm. we shouldn't, we shouldn't dictate what women should do. Agreed. Yeah. In the church. So this is from the Enzyme magazine on March, 1980. In the church, there is full equality between in the church, there is full equality between man and woman. Lies. 
like we've just gone over all the reasons all those times where they weren't equal so so women can't like they they you've taken away their priest power like they can't vote they can't they're they're in every way not equal like they've even been saying that they're they're not as strong they're i don't know yeah anyway i should have come up with a list i'm just yammering right now but like that's not true at all okay anyway so from the Enzyme magazine of March 1980, they give a list of reasons why why we should be against the ERA. So that people will ask for, there will be abortion on demand. Until women have the right um, to an abortion, they do not benefit from the Equal Rights Amendment. So that's, that's I can't remember who said that one. But so, which I think is really cool. Like, I didn't think about that. But if women don't have a right to an abortion, then you don't have, you don't have. Then you don't rights. have bodily autonomy. Right. Because men have bodily autonomy. Nobody gets to tell them what they're doing with their body. So it's only equal if women also get to have rights and bodily autonomy. Right. And then legalize, we've talked about this before, but legalize lesbian and homosexual marriages. A, um, a result would be that any children brought to such a marriage by either parent or adopted by the couple can legally be raised in a homosexual home. So like, what? that's not a bad thing. Um, we've seen studies upon studies of parents, le gays and lesbian parents that are just as good, if not better than homosexual, than heterosexual parents. That's just because we're better. <laughs> I mean, I, we're gooder at being parents. Good and gooder. <laughs> so the military draft. So the the church was arguing that there would be mixed housing, there'd be more sexual abuse, women would be killed in combat. And the church points out that the, the church pointed out funny, it was funny that the church pointed out that the Congress already has the power to draft women. So like if if the if Congress already has that power, then why are you saying that, that the ERA would make them have power if they already have it? So like, that doesn't really. And they already have women in, um, in the military, in the military. And it's like, there is already a sexual abuse, but it doesn't matter that the ER, like the ERA did not affect that. Right. And then legalizing homosexual marriages in 2015, we I had the right to anyway. marry. Like, so Yeah. Abortion is now partially illegal in most of the country, but it was legal for a long time, and regardless of the ERA. Right. So a lot of there's a lot of these things that they're worried about are are no longer relevant. One another concern was that they would eliminate legal responsibility for both spouses. I'm not sure how that would be, but the husband would have no responsible would the husband would not be responsible for wife's medical bills. Husband would not be legally would not be legally obligated to pay child support. Married women would have no legal no legal guarantee of financial support and there would be increased social security tax. So like, so they're just imagining that somehow marriage will not be binding the same right. way it was before. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't understand the logic behind that one. Um, cause like if you and I get married, then we have to share, we have mm -hmm. to share these responsibilities. Like if, like if we have kids together and we get divorced, we have to like child support is a thing about your income ratio, not about your, at genitals. the time, was it like specifically geared towards men? And like, if it wasn't like I, they thought that it, if they had equal rights, that the the men would not be required to fulfill these things because women weren't. I don't know. Um, I have to check on the. I don't know, but that doesn't apply either. With regardless of the ERA not being passed, it right. Like that's not. Anyway, yeah, that's not a thing. So that's that's a non-issue right now. Um, male female integrate. So this is one thing I thought was funny that they pointed out. If the ERA passes, there will be male, female integrated apartments at BYU and single sex public bathrooms. So although the Equal Rights Amendment would not likely be, have changed the rules on public bathrooms, this is a real concern for many. So like, they're like, oh no, we'll have to have bathrooms. Like that, that was a big deal in the uh, Mrs. America TV show also. But also the male and female apartments. So you can't, you can't. So like we went to BYU, Idaho and like our apartment, the carriage house um, where there was no men at all. But the equal mm -hmm. rights would be like, oh, you can't bar a man from, from going into that apartment um because of his sex so i guess they're really worried about like sexual deviance or deviation or the law of chastity i guess anyway okay do you want to go okay opposing the amendment in march 1980 since the first presidency believes that basic freedoms pertaining to the family and society's moral climate will be eroded if the era is passed the church has a moral responsibility validated by history and doctrine to oppose the amendment it's a moral issue by history and doctrine like it's doctrine anyway so this is another from sonia johnson from 1980 it's from her the ha housewife to heretic book as this rhetoric becomes more and more elevated on the one hand and on the other in the real world where in the real world where women actually experience their lives the, li the lid of oppression is just 
as descending at the same rate that the rhetoric is ascending. The language is a deliberate attempt to distract women from noticing what is really happening to them in their lives. It is a deliberate attempt to manipulate our perceptions so we will believe what it benefits men to have us believe. Yeah. No kidding. Smash the patriarchy. <laughs> okay. So the church today with the Equal Rights Amendment. So we're getting into um, nowadays. Women have spoken regularly. So from the church, this is from the church's website. They say women have spoken regularly in, in general conversations from 1984 to the present. Oh. So they're like acknowledging, yeah, you guys couldn't actually speak until 1984. So that answers that earlier question. So like, uh, yeah, I thought it was the 80s. Yeah. So this is from the last two years of general conference. So in April of 2022, there were five female speakers, which is actually quite a lot, and 31 male speakers. And then in October, there was four female speakers and 31 male speakers. And then just these, the, just this year, in April, there was two female speakers and 32 male speakers. And then this latest general conference in October of 2023, there were only three female speakers and 30 male speakers. So super equal, right? So women's voices are just as important as men's because we're speaking just as much as them. Oh, wait, no, we're not. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting frustrated when, anyway, women, men are more intelligent. Like, why won't they let women speak in conference? They might anyway. say something. Okay, so this is an old slide. Um, it's from Miss in Sunday School. This one's from 2019, but it's it's there's I, there's not a recent one, but it's the same gist. Um, there are women. When, you'll see men's roles on one side and women's roles on the other, and it's just the Relief Society, young women, and and general and the primary. So Why you can is... be over other kids, you can be other over women, and you can be over the young the young women. That's all. What you can be over other women, young women, and children. And that's children. it. And that's all. And men are not going to be over. We don't. The men don't children. need to take it. <laughs> like even though there's bo little boys in primary, we're not going to be concerned about that because that's a woman. That's a woman's job. Yeah. Okay. Elaine Dalton in 2013, she says, "Young women, you will be the ones who will provide the example of virtuous womanhood and motherhood. You will continue to be virtuous, lovely, praiseworthy, and of good report. You will also be the ones who will provide the example of family life in a time when families are under attack, being redefined and disintegrating." You will understand your role and your responsibilities, and thus you will see no need to lobby for rights. Like I, it's like this is in 2013. Don't lobby for rights, and we'll talk about 2013 is a really interesting time now, also. But like, I, it's interesting that she's saying you will like do these things because we're worried that you're not going to be doing them. Like I don't know, I just don't. I don't like when the leaders do that. It's very, um, like, is manipulative the right word? Brainwashy. Yeah, I don't. I don't like it. Okay, do you want to? And Russell Ballard in 2013. Now, sisters, while your input is significant and welcomed in effective councils, you need to be careful not to assume a role that is not yours. Ouch. And he said a lot of other problematic things too. But And then General Conference of April 2013. After 183 years, Jean Stevens was the first woman to pray in General Conference. Woo! Like it took us that long. 2013. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why 2013 was really problematic or was the, I guess why the church is um, pushing against women's lobbying for rights and then kind of giving women rights because they're letting women pray now. And they're like, oh, we'll give you a little bit. We'll let you pray. What? Who, who, who cares? <laughs> who cares about praying? There's like, there's no power in that. Whatever. Anyway, priesthood session in October 2013, as 130 women stood outside the tabernacle on Saturday afternoon, rejected in their bid to secure tickets for the all-male priesthood session in the nearby conference center, dozens of boys and men streamed inside to pick up last-minute tickets to the meeting. So that was from the Salt Lake Tribune. And if I'm not mistaken, men could go to the women's conferences back when we had women's conferences, like the week or so before conference. Men could go to those and we had men speakers. So I don't know why men would be barred from going because literally they're speaking. They, they always have a man speak it in the women's conferences. It can't just be the women. So, so they can go to our conferences, but we can't go to theirs. I remember it being very hush hush strangely because seeing them now, like they don't say anything all that interesting in the priesthood sessions. No, no. Um, but also I was on my mission in October of 2023 and I'm pretty sure this was the session that I came. It might be. No. Yeah. It was this session. I'm pretty sure. Um, but my my companion, um, she was from Sweden and she was about to go home and she'd never been to conference. So we asked the members, we took our, we took some investigators with us and we all went down to conference. We were up in Wyoming. So it was like a really long drive, um, but they took us to conference. And I remember 
um, I think this was this session, but they, I think a lot of the women were wearing purple as a, as a, like to show that they were all together in, in trying to get into the priesthood session. And um, I happened to be wearing purple that day and people were like, oh no, they're going to think that you're, they're going to think you're a feminist. They're going to think you're trying to lobby for rights. And I was like, what? I'm a missionary. And like, I was, I felt embarrassed, um, which is silly because um, I would have been right there with them had I been, had I been aware at all. But uh, yeah. Okay. So now, now you're woke. <laughs> so the priestess session in, so the next priestess session in April of 2014, um, ordained women um, marched again on Temple Square and seeking and seeking admission to the priestess session of General Conference. So they 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 they're doing it again. They're like, can we please get into General Conference? And then you hear there's a picture of Kate Kelly here with her priestess session tickets. So she has tickets, and they still won't let her in. And then you'll see back here. There's Kate Kelly also in the in the little orange and purple clothes. So anyway, do you want to go on this one? Uh, General Conference in October 2022. So last year. Tracy Y. Browning became the first black woman to speak in general conference. She had been called to the primary general presidency earlier that year. Yeah. So like it's taken us this long to have a black woman in there. Um, another question that I had that I really want to research more on is the, when were black women allowed in the relief society? Cause I, cause I don't think that they were allowed at all during the beginning of Relief society. And I don't think that they were in the Utah period during Brigham Young and John Taylor and, and them. Um, and then there was a time we can, we're going to do another um, episode about the Relief society, but then Relief society after a while, just became um, membership became automatic. Whereas before you had to be voted in and you had to be, people had to agree for you to be in there. And sometimes the people said, no, you can't be in Relief society. Anyway, so I'm just wondering at what point did black women, were they allowed into, into the Relief Society? Because we think of we think of white women and their rights, but, but black women had even less rights and it took them even longer to get anywhere near where white women were. So like, this is just, this just feels so icky to me that it's like, like the, just the, the oppression of, of black women. I, anyway, I, I just hate this. Like, I'm really glad for Tracy Browning. Like she gave a great talk. Like she's a great person. I'm, I mean, I'm, I think she's a great person. I don't know her, but like, I, anyway. Okay. So the 38th state, although Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the equal rights amendment in 2020, it has not been added to the constitution. What? So we have all the states necessary and it still won't be passed. And to my knowledge, what, what I understand is that when, when this gets passed to the person who signs it off, um, he got it and he was like, Oh, do I sign it off? It's been so many years because they added a timeline to it, to the ERA. Um, and we for sure exceed the timeline, but that shouldn't matter. I think timelines with that kind of things are the first amendment took what over a hundred years to be passed. Um, it was in there forever. Anyway. So like timelines are stupid. We shouldn't worry about that with amendments of the constitution. Anyway. Um, where was I going with that? Um, oh yeah. The person who got it in front of him to, he was going to sign off of it. He, he was like, Hey, do I sign this? It's been too long. And they're like, Oh yeah, don't sign that. Like we need to, so it still hasn't been ratified anyway. Um, and this is the last slide and this is not the most recent thing. The church, I'm pretty sure there's more things, especially with the legal stuff coming out right now, like with a burger and everything. But this is a post from the Salt Lake Tribune in 2019. The church, LDS church announces it still opposes the Equal Rights Amendment as supporters rally at Capitol. So even today, the church is very against um, giving women equal rights. So like that's, yeah, we're, we're, and there's a lot of people out there that thinks that the equal rights will never be passed. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to think that there's still hope uh, for that happening um, I'm hoping to have um, a woman from the Utah ERA coming on and we can talk to her about everything and interview her and discuss our rights. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's our presentation today about the church and the equal rights amendment. Any final thoughts? Um, I am worried that it will never be passed because like there, nobody's going to focus on it right now when there's like two wars going on and we're yeah. on the verge of world war three, probably like nobody's going to think about it until it calms down a little bit, which could be years. Mm -hmm. well, who knows if the United States will even last I feel long like it enough. would be so easy for them to just, to just pass just it. sign it. Just sign it. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully you can join us again when we do an interview. Um, her name is Kelly from the Utah ERA. And you can join us as we discuss that. Um, if you can, just please support us. There's on the website, analyzingmormonism.com. There's places where you can donate or you can donate to my Venmo or our Venmo.
In addition to that, if you want, please follow me on Patreon where I release videos that I don't release in other places. Um, so more exclusive content, I guess. And if you go to the top tier, we give away or we give you a free book, Mormon history book. So. Yeah, so we're publishing. We've got John D. Lee. We've got Analyza, Wife Number 19, more, um, William Smith on Mormonism. Mm -hmm. We've got the Nauvoo Expositor in book form because it's really big. Reading the newspaper is, is, is really... A, um, just really hard to read. I don't know how people read newspapers. They're like kind of, anyway. Um, yeah. So please join us next time. Um, take care and have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye.